Some regions are famous for having a lot of fossils, like the Lameda Formation in India, but this new find helps to push that idea even further because these authors describe 256 different fossilized eggs, consisting of three different nesting patterns and six different egg types essentially just smaller structures and details that are present in the eggs themselves. And that means a lot for what we can understand about the animals that laid these eggs, the titanosaurian sauropods. So potentially some of the largest animals to ever walk the planet. First, there's the kind of obvious thing. There's six different egg types, so you can differentiate those egg types. That means there's six different animals laying them. So during the latest Cretaceous in India, there were at least six species of large sauropods just knocking about. And this would have been just before the giant rock from space came and hit the planet and then they all died, which sucks for them, but that's just the way life is sometimes. And that means we can tell that they were pretty diverse up until that extinction, but also with the three different egg laying patterns, that means that there's probably more going on with the diversity. Because that means they probably weren't from a super recent ancestor, instead they had probably diversified millions and millions of years earlier and then eventually developed their own in some cases, egg laying patterns, and then additionally their own egg shells that we could kind of tell the difference of. So there's a lot going on here, it just happens to be that they were laying eggs in the same places, but just had those slight differences that worked for them. There's also some other neat things we can tell because a lot of these eggs have what's called a hatchling window, meaning essentially you can see where the hatchling broke out of the egg from and went on and lived its life. And some of these actually look like they were shifted from place to place. Essentially, it started to break out of one area of the shell and then moved and pivoted its body and broke out of a different area. That means that first area it tried to break out of, some of those egg shell pieces were able to collapse and fall inwards inside of the egg. This also really helps to suggest that there wasn't some sort of pre-built weakness into the thick shell of sauropod eggs. Instead, the sauropod hatchlings themselves were already well equipped to break out of their shells. In fact, there's some fossils coming from South America, which helps to show that they probably had some sort of bony structure near the front of their head. This would have been like the egg tooth in many modern animals, except in the sauropods, they had a thicker egg shell, so it needed a thicker egg tooth, even if it's not necessarily a tooth. Not all of the eggs were so simple to understand though, because there were some things that were wrong with some of them that we could actually tell. For example, some of them had multiple shells, which would have made it much harder for the animal to actually break out. Or potentially, again, it could have just been infertile. There's a lot of variability in that kind of thing, but we find that kind of thing happening in both modern reptile eggs and also bird eggs. There was one, however, that showed something different than just being multi-shelled. It was ovum in ovo, so essentially an egg inside of an egg. And this is kind of something that can happen. It's almost like having two yolks, but there's an additional eggshell and two yolks. It's something that we don't actually find in modern day reptiles, but we do find it in birds. And when we understand the differences between reptile egg laying and bird egg laying, it kind of makes sense. And that's because of essentially, is it all dumping at once or is it more sequential? When we look at something that lays a lot of eggs in the reptile family, we can look at sea turtles. And from the footage we've seen of them digging up their nests, you can see that they just kind of dump all their eggs in at once really quick. It's, you know, you go and you leave. But rather than just dumping them all in at once, they still kind of did at some point, it was probably still a more organized process, much like modern birds, where birds essentially can lay one egg and then another one very distinctly at different times. So it was probably a much more organized process like that for these sauropods. Not necessarily over the course of taking many days like it does for birds, but again, just there's one, there's two, and taking a little bit longer in this process. And when considering how large these eggs were, it makes some level of sense. This could be a way to help protect the eggs and have them more controlled as they're entering the shallow pit that would have been dug. And in fact, the shallow pits the authors make a note are kind of similar to those that many crocodilians make. So we can see a lot of these kind of same parallel lines tracking between the sauropods and then also some of their relatives, both the birds and the crocodilians, which for their living reptiles, that's on either side of them. So it's really interesting to see how, at least with their reproductive systems, it seems like they were kind of in the middle as far as their behaviors. But there's still some things that make these a little bit more unique. For example, these nests were all really densely packed together, which means it's not super likely that they were necessarily taking care of their young, because if there's so many nests and you have a multi-ton animal moving through, there's a good chance some of the young are going to get a little bit flattened. 
frankly. Which really isn't great for a species that's trying to survive. So it's pretty likely that they essentially just had some of them go to what would have been the center of this nesting ground, lay their eggs and they moved out and everything just builds out until they're all nested. And then once the eggs hatch, they were probably pretty great at taking care of themselves right away. I already mentioned that we didn't find any embryos or any embryo fossils inside of any of these eggs, but we don't find any young just outside of the nests either. They pretty much seems like they hatched, popped out and went off to find food in their kind of marshy environment that these nests were laid in. And part of the reason you can tell this is because of the sediments, it's a lot of mudstone, but also occasionally there's nests that are just entirely devoid of hatched eggs, which means most likely that there was some slight flooding in this kind of marshy environment, and it flooded some of the most peripheral nests to that marsh. So the ones that were closest to the shoreline, which sucks for those ones, but also they're pretty rare out of the 256 eggs. So even with some of these nests getting flooded, most of them were totally fine. So this strategy clearly worked for these titanosaurs. And again, six different species of titanosaurs. There's a lot of variation and they all held it together pretty well. So all in all, these 256 egg fossils really helped to answer a lot of questions about sauropods and their breeding and especially how they laid eggs. But that also leaves a lot of questions like, were they actually that independent right after they hatched? And the best way to try and find that out is to get more fossils, which means we need more paleontologists, both in the field looking for new things and also in museum collections, because there's a lot of stuff in museum collections. So there's always gonna be more to try and find out about sauropods.